Hello, my fellow Almontians, and welcome back to another broadcast from the bunker. Ah, it's a beautiful sunny Friday, so after you finish your schoolwork, make sure you get outside, folks. All right, today's hot topic, we're talking about groundwater. Uh, how does permeability, porosity, and capillarity affect groundwater? Uh, that precious resource that uh, certainly nobody can live without. So, pretty cool topic today. Uh, jump back uh, to the GC or do now is questions 13 to 16. Uh, take a minute, work hard on those, and I'll meet you there. Okay. So number 13 today, uh, the diagram below represents a planet revolving around in an elliptical orbit around a star. Uh, as the planet makes one complete revolution around the star, starting at the position shown, the gravitational attraction between the star and the planet will do what? Well, here we are closest to the star, right? So that's that, uh, that Greek word, right? The closest of perihelion. So when you're closest, you have the greatest gravitational attraction, uh, the star will look the biggest, but also because the greater gravity will make you go the fastest. So as I go this way, I'm getting further from the star, gravity force decreasing, therefore velocity decreasing. And as I go back this way, I'm getting closer. Uh, so again, increase of gravity, increase in velocity. So you got to go with uh, uh, decreasing and then increasing for choice A. All right, so choice A on that one. And please write in there, uh, this distance here, right? The perihelion. Okay. Again, you have to pardon my handwriting there. I'm writing on a bouncy vertical screen. Okay, uh, next one, uh, number 14. All right, it says, which diagram best represents the heliocentric model? Well, helio is the prefix for helium, and our sun is fusing uh, hydrogen into helium currently, right? Hydrogen plus hydrogen, uh, two lighter elements combined makes a heavier element, helium. Uh, and heliocentric, right? Sun-centric. So you got to find one where the sun's in the center, so these two are out. That leaves you with this one or this one. Now, in this one... Uh, you got the moon orbiting the sun with the earth doing this very strange orbit here. Uh, that is not what's going on, right? The earth is the bigger body, so it's going to control the orbit of the moon, not vice versa. So let's go down to choice D and take a look there. Uh, there's your sun in the center, heliocentric, earth orbiting the sun, and then the smaller moon orbiting the earth, and that's what's going on. Uh, the moon is the Earth's only natural satellite, they call it. Um, and objects that orbit a star are called planets. All right. So we're going to go with choice four on that one. Okay. Number 15. Number 15, the diagram below represents the orbits of three planets, X, Y, and Z. Here they are, X, Y, and Z. Uh, star A is located at one focal point, and B is the other. So there is your uh, gravity controlling force in this orbit, and B is just a blank point, another point in space. Uh, no star there. Uh, numbers one through seven represent different position of the planets. The arrows show the direction of revolution. So we're going counterclockwise, just like Earth does in a um, North Pole view. All right. Let's see what it wants to know. The orbital paths of these planets around star A can be described as having, well, how would you describe those orbits? Do they have the same length major axis? No, that would be the diameter this way, and they clearly have different lengths of that. Same period of rotation, we have no idea on this diagram how fast those planets are rotating. Uh, we can only infer revolutionary rates. 
Uh, elliptical shape, yeah, that's true. With star A as one of the focal points, that's a home run right there. Uh, so that's what we're going with. Circularly, certainly D is not correct, right? It's not a circle, it's an ellipse. So you got to go with choice C. All right. The last one is an eccentricity calculation problem. And uh, here we go. It wants you to find the eccentricity of this orbit. So, yes, hopefully you use your ruler. Uh, you're going to measure from here to here, right? That's the distance between focal points. And then you're going to divide by the length of the major axis, and that's from x to x. All right? So take your measurements, see what you're getting. Uh, we will not have the same numbers depending upon how much you zoom, but we will get the same answer if you do it right. So my numbers look like about... About a 4.5 divided by eh, roughly a 9. Now notice I didn't put any units there. The units are going to cancel in this anyway, so I left those off. And when I do that, I can bring up my calculator. Everybody's got a calculator handy. So I go 4.5 divided by 9. And I'm getting about a 0.5 eccentricity, uh, which is uh, quite elliptical. So now this was a part two type problem. It would ask you to write the equation. So you'd have to write E equals D over L, right? And that's in your reference tables, folks, which is right here. And if you forgot that formula, it's not a big deal. It's uh, right there. Distance between foci divided by length of the major axis. I abbreviated that. Right there, E equals D over L. Uh, it also wants you to substitute the measurements. So you would put your numbers in there like we did, and then calculate it. That's 8.5. Notice it doesn't say with units because, again, the units cancel, but you need to have it in decimal form. Sometimes it will ask you to put it in the thousands place, which it usually does, and then you would need three numbers after the decimal. So in my case, that would be 0.500. Okay. All right, any further questions on those? Uh, you guys know to put them in the YouTube section down below. All right, let's jump into our groundwater lesson today. Okay. All right, and once again, we are heading below the surface to check out uh, what happens when it rains and the water gets in the ground. They call that infiltration. Uh, a bunch of cool pictures up top here. The green represents the spaces between the rocks. Those are pore spaces. We're going to talk about that. Here in the tubes, you see the gray water being pulled up to different heights. Uh, that's called capillarity, right? We're going to jump into that. Uh, here you have uh, sediments that are different distances apart. Some are crushed together, some are more spread out. We'll talk all about that. Okay? All right. Well, water uh, wants to get into the ground, but it can't always get there. So when it can't get there, we get what's called flooding, and boy, does it create uh, some serious problems. It will eventually wear away anything. This was a solid highway, as you could see. And because the water couldn't get in the ground, it flooded on the surface, and that creates a lot of friction and serious erosion. And when the material gets eroded away from down below, then the roadway collapses above. Uh, so this whole infiltration process is critical for maintaining infrastructure, homes, things like that. Okay, I know uh, many of you uh, remember Hurricane Sandy. Uh, the amount of flooding on the south shore of Long Island was amazing um, because obviously it can't all infiltrate right away. Okay? Anyway, there's your definition. We're going to start out with porosity, right? Uh, make sure you get that, uh, read that through. It's literally the amount of pore space between sediments underground. All right? These are tighter together. That's less porosity. These are looser. There's more porosity. These are a mixture of different sizes, so the little guys fill in the spaces. That's less porosity, uh, and that's going to affect how fast water gets in the ground. All right, so there's your definition. Get it down, the amount of empty space in the ground. And there are many factors that affect porosity. 
All right, first off, we're going to start out over here with the shape. If your particles are round, uh, you tend to have more air space in the ground, so water has more places to hide. Right? Round particles will have more porosity. If they're angular, uh, the air spaces tend to be a little tighter and you can't get as much water in the ground. Next up is packing. I don't know if you ever planted a uh, tree or a, a, any kind of shrub. Uh, you don't want to crush the soil down after you plant it, right? You want to kind of leave it a little loose so the water can get in. Well, a loose pack is going to have more airspace, obviously, more porosity. Whereas if you stomp that soil down, which is tempting, right? You want to make sure the plant stays straight. Uh, but then air, uh, air is less and the water can't get in. The plant's going to end up dying. So there's a happy medium there. All right, loose pack will have more porosity than a tight pack. And the third variable there, sorting. Look at the difference in these two pictures. These are all the same size, which is not realistic for soil. Our soil has a mixture of different sizes. But if it's closer to uh, one size, they say it's more uniform, uh, and you'll have more airspace in the ground. That's a well-sorted soil. Where if it's mixed, uh, like a glacier would do, everything's just mixed together, then you tend to have less airspaces and less porosity. Okay? How does it affect, uh, how does grain size affect things? Well, if you look at these three beakers, you probably think uh, one of them might have more porosity than the other, but that is not correct. If you simply change the size and nothing else, then there will be zero difference in porosity. So the size of those particles will not affect the porosity. Uh, that's if it's a uniform sample, if they're all small, all medium, all big. Okay, then the size won't affect it. If you mix these together, then yes, you'll have less porosity. So uh, make sure you follow that down there. As particle size increases in this case, porosity stayed the same. Okay, this is kind of a fun one here. Uh, permeability, right, the ability for water to get in. Uh, if you wear a, uh, if you use an umbrella, it's impermeable, right? Uh, in Spanish, uh, the word for raincoat, I believe, is uh, impermeable, meaning uh, the water can't get in. Uh, and that's what's going on here. So we have four samples, gravel, sand, silt, and clay. Uh, I'm going to zoom in on these. We're going to put water in there. Which one do you think the, uh, the water will infiltrate to uh, get in the fastest? Well, let's take a look. All right, and we're going to add the water. Oop, hold up one second. Hold up one second. That's uh, frozen on me. Try that again. There we go. Okay, so now I'm going to add the water. And it's all the same water on the top. Now take a look. The gravel's going down the way faster. It's already leaking through. The sand a little slower. Silt even slower, obviously, right? It's a much smaller particle. It's tougher for the water to infiltrate. And look at the clay, folks. Uh, it'll take almost forever to get any water through clay. It makes a total uh, sealed layer. And normally on aquifers where water's trapped in the ground, You'll have this very, 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 very uh, fine sediment, usually clay, that uh, prevents the water from seeping down. So if you want to drill a well, uh, you drill down until you hit that clay mark, and you'll have a whole bunch of water on top. Okay? So the greatest infiltration is going to be with the largest particle size. Okay. Uh, so get your definition in there, permeability, how easily a fluid can pass through a material. And of course, if you're talking rate, that's how fast it does it. Uh, a similar chart as before, but now with permeability instead of porosity. Take a look. How does size affect things? Which one will be more permeable? Well, if you said the bigger particle, you're correct. Uh, larger particles allows water to get in faster. Uh, smaller ones, right, it slows that water down. What about this scenario here? Right? Packing versus uh, loose pack. Which one will water get in faster? Well, if you said the loose pack, you're correct. Uh, if it's tightly packed, if you stomp that uh, soil down, you're going to slow down the rate of permeability. And the last one here, which one do you think will uh, be more permeable? Well, if you said the one with 
uniform size, uh, you are correct. If you mix the sizes, well, your porosity goes down and it becomes less permeable. Okay. A couple of graphs, what do they look like? Let me see your arms in motion there. If particle size increases, what happens to permeability? Well, hopefully you did something like that. The bigger the particle size, the more permeable it is. And how about infiltration versus permeability? If infiltration increases, is it more or less permeable? Well, if you said direct relationship, you're correct. Okay? Okay, let's keep rolling. What's going on here? Check out this experiment. You might have done this in elementary school. Uh, you put different colors in a jar, and you go out and get some white carnations. Uh, and uh, you will get all these really cool colors. Well, what's happening there? Uh, a little experiment you can do at home quite easily. Uh, what's going on? Well, obviously some of this red dye must be going up into the flower. Blue here and green there. And it does so by the process of capillarity. That's right, folks, capillarity. And there it is. There's your definition. Water can actually defy gravity and go upwards. You see it in paper towels all the time. Uh, but it can also work its way up with plants. And that's how those, one of the ways, those tall trees, right? You get a tree 100, 200 feet tall. It's able to get water out of the ground and go up 200 feet by this process of capillarity. There's a little more going on, but that's the basic of it. All right. So there's your definition. Uh, and there it is. If you are more tightly packed, the water has an easier time climbing up. Whereas if it's a loose pack and the, or big particles, the water can't climb up as high. And we use, uh, I like the thing about Santa Claus in this example. If the chimney is so big, uh, you know, and Santa's trying to climb up the chimney, he puts his back on one side, his feet on the other, but he can't touch, so he can't climb up very high. Whereas if it's a much smaller chimney, you can put your back on one side, your feet on the other, and kind of cinch your way up. Uh, so with a smaller, a tighter area, water can climb higher. All right? Uh, and that's what's going on there. Larger size will give you less capillarity, whereas smaller size will give you more. What do the graphs look like? Well, if particle size increases, the water can't get as high. And you're looking at an inverse relationship there. Over here, water retention. Well, that means retain means to hang on to. So which one would hang on to the most water? Well, the one where the water can climb the highest, right? So if your particle size is increasing like this, you're going to hang on to less water, and down it goes. Okay? Uh, hopefully you're following along so far. All right. Let's check out some uh, summary questions, see how you did. Please pause the video here, take a few minutes to work on those. Uh, the first one, it says, uh, which graph best shows how the infiltration rates would compare uh, well, which one can water infiltrate the fastest, do you think? Well, hopefully you're saying the one that has looser, bigger particles. So C would be the fastest, but what it, which graph works with that? Uh, well, C would have to be the highest. There, they're the same. That's the low. That's the low. So hopefully you went with choice one, right? You're increasing uh, infiltration as the size increases. Over here, greatest porosity. Well, if you want a lot of porosity, a lot of airspace, uh, well, hopefully you went with a well-sorted, meaning uh, a uniform size. They're not mixed sizes and loosely packed. You didn't stomp on it. That'll give you the most airspace or porosity. Over here, compared to the model containing larger particles, the model with the smaller ones will have, and this one you got to just kind of work through them, uh, and hopefully you ended up coming up with uh, smaller particles would be less permeable, right? It takes longer for the water to get in, but the water can climb up easier, right? Greater capillarity. Jumping over to this one, which characteristic is most likely the same? Well, now we have the same shape. Uh, they're uh, sorted out by the same size. So believe it or not, the same number of air spaces exists in each one. And we call that term, of course, porosity. All right, over here, which soil conditions uh, would have the greatest amount of runoff? Well, runoff is like a flood. If the water can't get in, it's got to go someplace. It runs along the surface. They call that runoff or flooding. 
Uh, and that's going to be a plate case where the water can't get in, right? It's not very permeable. And if it's a steep slope, right? Because the water is just going to run downhill instead of infiltrating into the ground. Over here, results of the experiment uh, lead to the conclusion of, well, hopefully you read that through. You came up with choice two. You're going to have greater capillarity in soils with smaller particles, right? If it's a small particle, again, that water can climb up much easier. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, hopefully you uh, followed along there. Uh, any additional questions? Remember, you can type them into the section below or, uh, you know, um, send them through Remind. I'm still getting more students joining Remind. Uh, a little concerning. You guys haven't been on that all year. Kind of strange. But uh, whatever. Uh, better late than never, I suppose. All right, folks. Do your, uh, do your work. Get outside and uh, enjoy the sun as soon as you can. Take care.